Good morning. Ooh. Wow. Uh, lovely to see you all and a warm welcome to our service here this morning at Cockpen and Carrington. Lovely to be gathered together in person and also a warm welcome to you if you are watching on the recording. Wherever you are tuning in from, you are most welcome today. And today, my goodness, we come all the way through Lent to Palm Sunday. Just one week left to go before Easter time. And in our service today, we'll be doing a few different things. We are going to be thinking about uh, Palm Sunday and uh, celebrating Jesus coming into uh, the city of Jerusalem. Uh, we'll think about the manner in which he did that. Of course, that we reflect that he did that riding on a donkey. And we'll think about how he, in doing that, announces something of the nature of God's kingdom, what he was about and what uh, the kingdom was, was about that he's bringing in. Uh, one where the mighty are laid low and the humble, the meek, raised up. Uh, one where oppression is ended and care and equality reign. So we'll be thinking about that as we think about Palm Sunday. Uh, and we also, though, will be coming to the end of our Lent series today. Uh, this is the last Sunday in Lent. And so as we come to the end of that series in which we've been thinking about finding rest in worship, uh, slowing down a bit and enjoying God's presence, uh, we're going to think today about in linking in with Jesus' kingdom of ending oppression and bringing care uh, and love. We'll think about uh, finding rest in our lives and in particular for folk who today are oppressed in uh, unjust work systems uh, around our world. People who can't find rest because of that in their situation. And so we'll be thinking about that too. And as we think about valuing, or have been thinking about too, valuing our rest, that we need to long that all can find meaningful rest and blessing in their lives in just systems today a part of God's kingdom flowing out. So uh, that is there. Um, I also have, uh, we notice just reminders about um, the various services happening through Holy Week. Some of the timings have been awry because they have perhaps changed over recent weeks. So the times of reflection in the morning if you're able to be up and out at eight o'clock. Uh, there are times of reflection at the Pitt Cairn Centre every morning this week, Monday to Friday, uh, eight to 8.30. Uh, and then the service at Our Lady has also changed. Uh, Father Michael very kindly agreed just a couple of weeks ago when he heard that their service was normally 7.30, he would put it un uniformly at seven as well. So all of the services uh, our, our Lady on Monday, Rosewell on Tuesday, La Suede on Wednesday, St. Leonard's in Dobby's Road on uh, Thursday, and here at Cockpen on Friday, each of the evening services at seven, if you're able to make that uh, at all, or any of them, you're most welcome. Thinking then too, to next Sunday, uh, there will be again an early morning, eight o'clock service up at Rosewell in the garden outside, weather permitting, uh, and then tea, coffee, and bacon rolls afterwards. Lovely early Easter morning celebration. And then all churches gathering here for the fifth Sunday of the month, all the churches gathering for a joint service here at Cock Pen for the Easter morning service at 11.30. That is in the magazine now, but just to remind uh, this morning. And I'll invite Liz to come with other intimations. Um, I've just received a card here. It says, Dear Liz, Wilma delivered to me the really nicely decorated vase with the flowers posy. What a nice surprise and very much appreciated. I will definitely be using the vase again um, in, the, in the future. Thank you for your kind thoughts. Enjoy a happy Easter weekend. Kindest regards from Anne. And that is Aunt Wilma. Um, Anne is Wilma's sister. 
So, um, and I must say, we've had a lot of people that were really taken by the, something different. Yeah. And an update from Bill McDonald, the duck race last Sunday raised £1,410, and that's to be shared evenly between Children First and the Last Wade Rugby Club Development Trust. And thanks to, goes to everyone who contributed towards this. And also talking about raising money, Moira Scott ran an Easter table sale at the Guild and the Natter and managed to raise the amazing sum of £315 for church funds. So well done, Moira. <laughs> <laughs> Included in this was, I guess, the birthday of Humpty Dumpty, which she knitted and prepared herself. And this was won, and it wasn't a fix, by Jim Scott. <laughs> <laughs> and the birthday was the 12th of December. Um, Jim very kindly donated uh, his prize to the High Bank Care Home where Maria is um, and they were having a raffle yesterday and I was down on Friday and I saw it was kind of place sitting there. So um, thanks Jim. Um, and we are holding um, for church funds a tea and toast morning in the hall in a couple of weeks time on the 6th of April. There'll be a tombola there and any donations for this would be appreciated. Also, anyone that is able to help on the day or on the Friday evening to set things up at the hall, please let me know. And there will also be a small bacon stall. And Lorna has said there'll be a joint service next week um, here with Lasswade and Rosewell and there'll be tea and coffee after the service. And just in case if anybody didn't get a little cross coming in, I'm not sure, I think there should be some left, but get one on the way out. Okay? Thank you. Thank you. And just one, uh, I'm also reminded that I was asked if I would uh, just let you know, as a church, we have um, joined this scheme. So you have seen this advertised in different places, but it's, uh, individuals, churches, groups can twin uh, with places, uh, poorer communities around the world, um, to twin a toilet. And uh, some of these places, I think it says at the bottom of the steps on, there's so many places around the world. It says one in four, uh, one in four people around the world don't have a, 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 a loo, a toilet to get to. By supporting toilet twinning, you're helping to flush away poverty. So it's a major issue in these places because you, you don't have proper toileting facilities. Facilities. Then there's all sorts of other issues for. I'm going to go on. Sorry, I did it the wrong way. Um, if you, <laughs> wow, yes, we're on now. Um, if you don't have these uh, toileting facilities to hand where you are, then there's all sorts of issues about. Um, not proper sanitation and health problems for communities so it's a lovely thing to be able to do and uh, so if you see that uh, poster out uh, at the front that explains what it's about we're supporting and our um, toilet is in the Kabali district of Uganda in a wee community there so that is something we've um, donated towards as a church and sharing in our in our world need so uh, there we are. That is an enormous amount to talk about at the start of our service. So let's, as we often do, just still hearts and minds and come back to our place of worship and be still in God's presence for a moment. Today on Palm Sunday, we celebrate that Jesus is King, King of creation, King of all nations, King of our lives. Let us worship with joy, with gratitude, with honor. Hosanna to the Son of David, to God's anointed one. Hosanna to the King who rides a peaceable donkey. Hosanna in the highest. And so we join to sing our opening hymn on that theme, 
join in the crowds who shouted welcome and praise to Jesus as he entered the city of Jerusalem. And we join to bring glory, Lord, and honor today to Jesus, our great Redeemer King. Let's join to sing. Join hearts in prayer, let us pray. 
gracious and merciful God, as we come before you today, our hearts are stirred by the image of Jesus, our Savior, riding into Jerusalem on a humble donkey. We lift our voices in adoration for the one who comes in the name of the Lord, bringing salvation and hope to our lives. Jesus, we adore you, the King of Kings, who chose humility over grandeur, a donkey over a chariot. In your humble entry, we see the embodiment of divine love and grace. You, who could have come in power, chose to come in meekness, teaching us the beauty of servant leadership. We worship you, Prince of Peace. Your entrance into Jerusalem heralds a kingdom where justice and peace ripple out, where the broken are healed and the oppressed find refuge. You are the fulfillment of our deepest longings and the source of eternal hope. Yet we confess that we do not always reflect the humility and justice of your life, there are times when we seek our own glory, forgetting the call to serve others. Forgive us for the moments when we have valued power over compassion and pride over humility. We acknowledge the brokenness in our world, the injustices that persist and the systems that oppress. Forgive us for our apathy and indifference Help us to confront and dismantle the structures that perpetuate inequality and injustice in our day. May your light shine in the dark corners of our hearts and our world. Merciful Savior, renew our spirits. Grant us the courage to live out the values of your kingdom, a kingdom marked by love justice and compassion. May your life be a constant reminder that true greatness is found in service and true power is displayed in humility. Empower us to be agents of change in our communities, standing up for the marginalized and speaking out against injustice. Let your love flow through us, breaking down barriers and bringing healing to the brokenhearted in and through your name. And we ask these things in your name and pray together the words of the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And we join to sing again, and a hymn that paints uh, very beautifully, the scenes of Palm Sunday. Uh, we come to sing, Here Comes Jesus on a Donkey, with a wee reminder that as we sing through the verses, the donkey's trotting faster and faster, and so we trot along faster and faster as well to keep up. So uh, we join to sing. <laughs>
introducing this first reading for this morning, which is uh, to do with our Rest in Worship series. Uh, we come to that final part of that series uh, today, that sense of finding rest in worship. And in our reflection a bit later on, we'll expand finding rest to think about all being able to find rest in their lives, especially those who are stuck in unjust systems of working. Our Old Testament passage, which Jim is about to come and read for us, revisits the importance of keeping a Sabbath rest for all, including servants. For at one time, the people of Israel were oppressed without rest as slaves in Egypt. But God came to their rescue and delivered them from that to enjoy well-being and the freedom to rest in their new lives. And so Jim will come and read our Old Testament passage for us this morning. <clears throat> Observe the Sabbath and keep it holy as I, the Lord your God, have commanded you. You have six days in which you do your work, but the seventh day is a day of rest, dedicated to me. On that day, no one is to work, neither you, your children, your slaves, your animals, nor the foreigners who live in your country. Your slaves must rest, just as you do. Remember that you were slaves in Egypt and that I, the Lord your God, rescued you by my great power and strength. That is why I command you to observe the Sabbath. He ends the first lesson. The second lesson is the, um, is the New Testament the gospel, I'm reading from Gospel of St. Mark, and it's Mark 11, 1 to 11, and it's uh, number 11, 1 to 11, here we are. The triumphant entry into Jerusalem. As he approached Jerusalem near the town of Bethphage and Bethany, they came to the Mount of Olives. Jesus sent two of his disciples on ahead with these instructions. Go to the village ahead of you. As soon as you get there, you will find a colt tied up that has never been ridden. Untie it and bring it here. And if someone asks you why you are doing that, tell him that the master needs it and will send it back at once. So they went and found a colt out in the street, tied to the door of a house. As they were untying it, some of the bystanders asked them, What are you doing untying that colt? They answered just as Jesus had told them, and the bystanders let them go. They brought the colt to Jesus, threw their cloaks over the animal, and Jesus got on. Many people spread their cloaks on the road, while others cut branches in the fields and spread them on the road. The people who were in front and those who followed behind began to shout, Praise God, God bless him who comes in the name of the Lord. God bless the coming kingdom of King David, our father. Praise God. Jesus entered Jerusalem, went into the temple, and looked around at everything. But since it was already late in the day, he went out to Bethany with the twelve disciples. Amen. Thank you, Jim and Bill. <coughs> Let's pray. Lord, thank you again for your word to us today. And we pray that you would bless us as we come to explore it this morning. And may we be open to all you have to say to us through it by your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Jesus has been on a demanding trek with his disciples and the crowd with them in setting the scene for today's passage in Mark's Gospel and Jesus' arrival in the city of Jerusalem. 
At the end of the previous chapter in Mark's Gospel, Jesus was in the town of Jericho, where he healed the blind man Bartimaeus. And it's a considerable trek from Jericho to Jerusalem. Jericho is the lowest city in the world, set at over 800 feet below sea level. And the city of Jerusalem isn't all that far away distance-wise, it's only about 12 miles or so, but it lies at nearly 3,000 feet above sea level, and the road to it lies through hot and dry desert. So you've got quite a walk between the two places. For all travel travelers along that road, there was then a wonderful sense of relief and exhilaration as you came at last to the top of the Mount of Olives and gained your first view, welcome sight of Jerusalem lying across the valley below you. Jesus and those with him joined with a great many others approaching the city, surrounded by excited pilgrims from many different places, all arriving to join family and friends to celebrate the Passover festival. But it is Jesus who becomes center stage on that day when he arrived, as he makes a planned entry to the city, riding on a colt, as Mark describes it. It's Matthew who guides us to see this as a young donkey. Those who've been traveling with Jesus have been expectant for some time that he is the one to rescue them from Roman rule and become their true king. And so the entry to Jerusalem becomes a triumphal one with people strewing cloaks across the road and others spreading branches from the fields. And those were things you did to honor and welcome a king. We know, of course, that the people had one kind of king in mind, a mighty political rescuer, but in his entry, Jesus was making a very clear statement that he was on an entirely different mission and would be an entirely different kind of king. Jesus arrived subverting the imagery of kingship and upending notions of power. Imagine the king of all creation choosing a donkey for his grand entrance. It's no ordinary choice of travel. It's a deliberate act of humility that challenges the prevailing notions of power and authority. Through this act, we see humility is the root of Jesus's leadership. He doesn't need a powerful steed to ride on, nor does he need blasting trumpets of welcome. He comes just as he is. In a world often stained by injustice, where the powerful oppressed the weak, Jesus' choice of a donkey confronts that injustice. It's a declaration that his kingdom operates on totally different principles, where the last shall be first and the humble will be exalted. In this story, we hear echoes of the prophet Zechariah, who wrote of a king who would come humbly riding on a donkey. And his triumph would not be seen in extravagance, but in humility. And as with much of the gospel accounts, Jesus is deliberately shown to have fulfilled past prophecies of the coming Messiah, reinforcing the belief for first Christians that he truly was the one they had been waiting for. And yet, even so, his life, his message, his actions did not map easily onto visions of a conquering powerful ruler. Instead, his very entry into Jerusalem carries the weight of a divine desire and call for justice and peace in a world that was marred by inequality and oppression. It is the Prince of Peace that rides into the city that day, not with the weapons of war, 
but with the promise of a kingdom where justice and peace are embraced. So on the surface, Jesus' entry to Jerusalem can seem a joyous celebration and heartening welcome to him as king. But going deeper, there are challenging notes sounding. When he reaches the temple, it's late that day, and so he simply looks around at what's going on. It's the following day when he comes back that tables of exclusion and injustice will be overturned, casting judgment on the powerful and wealthy who wield power for their own benefit and fail to express care and generosity to the outsider, the downtrodden, and the powerless. Understanding Jesus as the embodiment of justice challenges us too. It challenges us to confront the injustices in our societies today, to question oppressive systems that still go on, and to actively engage in the pursuit of justice. It challenges also to see us also to see that this does not mean that we will always succeed or be rewarded. That work is difficult of championing justice and peace. Announcing God's kingdom of justice and peace brought Jesus into complete conflict with the powers that be of his day and led to his violent death. It was and is a challenging path, and yet, as we love and trust in Jesus, we are invited to align our lives with the one modelled by our Saviour in seeking justice, peace, and equality. Whether through our prayers for the situations we know about, whether through giving to organisations like Christian Aid who champion justice and relief around our world, or raising our voices when we can support campaigns for justice. We're called to be committed and to seek to make a difference in ways that we can for Jesus in our times and our community and world. We're going to sing a hymn that reflects some of those themes uh, now ones that reflect those themes of the kingdom Jesus is bringing in, that breaks oppression, that comes to the help of the poor and needy, and where love and joy and hope will blossom. So let's join to sing, Hail to the Lord's anointed, great David's greater son.
as we come towards the end of Lent in arriving at Palm Sunday. So we also come to the end of our series, as I mentioned earlier, on finding rest in worship, valuing time to slow down and enjoy being in God's presence. And I hope that's been valuable over past weeks. Thinking into what we've been thinking about in Jesus's announcing God's kingdom of justice and peace and an end of oppression as he entered Jerusalem today. So we turn in our Lent series to think of those around us today who are unable to find rest because they are victims of unjust systems of work or exploitation. We began six weeks ago now, with a focus on the Ten Commandments in Exodus 20, where we were guided to take Sabbath rest because God rested after creating the world. We learned how God rested to enjoy all that was so beautifully made. And we learned too that we are called into that rest to enjoy God's presence, his creation, and each other as we share God's creation and look after it together. As we end our series today, we come to the Ten Commandments again, but in Deuteronomy 5. And we come there to a restating of the Sabbath commandment with a different reason for ensuring meaningful rest for all. This time, the command that no one should do any work on the Sabbath is based on the people of Israel remembering that once upon a time they had been slaves in Egypt, but the Lord had rescued them from that with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. And here Sabbath becomes a reminder that they have been liberated from that place of oppressive work. And all children, servants, animals, foreigners must be ensured that place of rest. And so it should be today. But many people in our world are stuck in cycles of not being able to rest due to poverty, prejudice, or injustice. We can see how unjust systems of work and outcome outcomes of human trafficking, for example, continue to enslave people and rob them of meaningful rest in their lives. Over these weeks, we've thought about finding and appreciating rest for ourselves, but this ought ought also to lead us to pray and work for other people's rights to rest as well. And further also, the Sabbath commandment and the Jubilee commandment within the law of the Bible that the people were given. That sense of rest and restoration of land, possessions, freedom for people given every seventh year. Clearly, those commands apply not only to humans, but to God's creation as well. And yet we can see the obvious impact of a lack of rest on our environment and on our climate. Jesus lovingly and courageously announced the coming of God's kingdom of justice and peace, of compassion and freedom from oppression in his dramatic entry to Jerusalem. May it be our prayer and the concern of all our hearts and our efforts today to see a fairer world with rest for all and the growing of the Lord's kingdom in every part. We're going to watch and listen to a video hymn now that expresses that longing for the Lord's kingdom to come in all its values and all its blessing for all. And it's a prayer that the Lord will transform, revive, and heal society, and that we will be a part of that together. Seek 
A powerful message there. But we join now to worship God in our offering.
Let us pray. Giving God, we come today humbled by our Saviour, emboldened by his message, held by his love, freed by his grace. And so we offer back these gifts in the hope that they help bring his mission and message to a world so in need. And we ask these things in his name. Amen. And so we come now also in a spirit of prayer to our prayers of thanksgiving and our prayers for others and ourselves. Let's pray. Loving God, we are so grateful for Jesus, for all his courage and determination, not only to pursue the road from Jericho to Jerusalem, but to press on through the whole course of his life and ministry to bring in your kingdom of justice and peace of love and compassion, of forgiveness and life. Thank you that through his death on the cross and his rising again, it was the beginning of making all things new, transforming and healing your world and creation through bringing in your kingdom. May it be our delight and passion to embrace your kingdom of love and be a part of bringing your light and love and hope to our world. Looking out across the world, we lift to you the global issues of poverty and injustice and climate crisis that deny rest today to so many and to creation. God of freedom and rest, we lament where work enslaves people. Help us make choices in how we spend our money that promotes freedom and equality for all. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Teach us to live freely and lightly. God of freedom and rest, we lament that people trafficking exists in our world. May your people stand up for rights for all and bring down those who make money from misery. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Teach us to live freely and lightly. God of freedom and rest, we lament that our environment is in crisis change our lifestyles to bring jubilee to your world and restoration to all you have made it is for freedom that christ has set us free teach us to live freely and lightly ever present god we bring our prayers for others for those around us who may be experiencing their own valleys of despair for the friend battling illness, the neighbor facing financial hardship, and the stranger wrestling with inner turmoil. Be their source of comfort and healing. For the lonely, the grieving, and the brokenhearted, bring the assurance of your comforting presence. We bring before you also our personal burdens, the silent cries of our, our hearts. You who know the depths of our souls and understand our pains and anxieties, may you lift the weight from our shoulders and replace it with the assurance of your love. Grant us the grace to trust you even when the path is unclear and the journey feels too difficult. May our faith be an anchor in turbulent seas, securing us in the knowledge that you are ever near. Pour out your spirit on us and renew our strength. And we ask all these things in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen.
And we come to our closing hymn this morning, which uh, is moving us on from that place of celebration on Palm Sunday to the stark reality of what lies ahead for Jesus in that week ahead that will lead to the cross, but then also to resurrection and glory. And so we join to sing, Ride on, ride on in majesty. Travelling through the wilderness of Lent, we have reached Jerusalem at last. But this is not quite journey's end. With crowds dispersed, palms discarded, we travel onward into Holy Week. With all its highs and lows, and pilgrimage towards a cross that will also lead us into life. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be with you all and remain with you now and evermore. <laughs>